Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our guest today is Terence Keeley, Vice Chancellor Emeritus at the University of Buckingham and author of, among other works, The Economic Laws of Scientific Research. You make a distinction between Francis Bacon's view of science and Adam Smith's. Can you tell us a bit about that? That's a nice question because I set the whole book up really as a debate between the two and they completely disagree with each other. Francis Bacon, who by the way was in many respects a very deep and great thinker, he was, for example, the person who invented the concept of progress. And uh, as I was saying yesterday, it's astonishing that the idea of progress is only 400 years old. Um, so he had some very deep thoughts and very good thoughts. But on the subject of economics of science, he, I think, got it absolutely wrong. He suggested that the Spanish had become the world's richest power as they were 400 years ago because Henry the Navigator had set up in uh, Sagres in western Portugal – essentially a research institute based on pure science, developing improved me methods of navigation. And he suggested that technology is the source of power and wealth, which we all agree with to this day. But he said the source of technology came from the government funding of, apply, of pure as well as of applied science. The trouble with that idea is that uh, it's based on a myth. Uh, Henry the Navigator never did that. He simply put out the story that he'd done all this research and development because he was trying to bolster his image in Europe. In fact, he was just a pragmatic um, uh, soldier and sailor. So did he name himself the navigator? <laughs> was that part of his self-promotion? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a nice question because he certainly was full of self-promotion, though I think that came later. Okay. Actually. That came later. <laughs> he himself never went uh, set, set on board a ship, funnily enough. It was oh, all, really? It was all know. done on land. <laughs> and um, – and he also said that science is a public good and he came up with all sorts of theories as to why that should be, which is still uh, repeated to this day. Adam Smith, unlike Francis Bacon, actually had seen an industrial revolution in action. He actually saw the early industrial revolution taking place in Scotland and he said it's simply not true that uh, technology, applied science, comes out of pure science. In fact, in those days, pure science was in such a sad state with people believing in things like phlogiston, uh, fire as a material or – the caloric theory that heat is material. He said it just isn't so. What actually happens is that technologists on the ground, in the factories, on the factory floor, make the developments, originate uh, the new ideas. And if anything, the flow of knowledge goes the other way, that the academics benefit from the advances made on the factory floor. And so the fundamental difference between the two is this. Adam Smith says you can leave science and development to the market it will find all the money it needs because of the motivation of companies to develop better science and technology on the factory floor. Whereas Bacon says, technology comes out of pure science. No one will fund pure science if the government doesn't do it. Therefore, governments have to fund pure science. So that's the very, very striking difference between the two models. Would you say this is kind of – Maybe a different conception of what science is for also at the backdrop of this because you could have these sort of pure scientific thought type of theory, maybe more like Bacon, whereas more useful science so, – so Adam Smith is focused on useful science and, and building things that help things – people live better lives. But thinking about the stars and all these things like that, people think that has its inherent worth too, even if it's not useful for anything. Yes. But Adam Smith was very suspicious of people who put in claims for government money for the greater public good. He did accept there were public goods. I mean he didn't deny that roads and schools could be public goods. But he always felt that you really had to justify government funding to private individuals who claimed to be doing it for the public good. And he would have argued – I'm sure – well, we know because he did talk about this. He would have argued that there is enough private funding of science either through – students paying fees to universities who can then via that money into research or coming straight out of the research of industrialists that you just don't need to burden the taxpayer with that. That's what I think he would have said. And you think – and the story is bigger than that too because in your book, Economic Law and Scientific Research in particular, it goes back to antiquity. I mean you think the Phoenicians had a thing different than the empires and, and moving up through there. Can you talk a little about how, how they had a leg up too and why? Well, it, the ancient world is very, very interesting on, on this subject. Um, the thing that he was particularly keen on, uh, Francis Bacon, was the extraordinary explosion of science uh, 
um, under the in the Hellenic Greek period, i.e. after the classical Greek period had come to an end, you then had the Hellenic Greek period, often based on, on what was going on in Egypt. And he describes that the uh, Ptolemies, in particular, invested a fortune in science and research, and they paid for the museum, and they paid for the library, and they sponsored a whole host of fantastic science. There's no question. They, they did fantastic science along the lines that you suggested, and some of the people that they funded worked out the diameter of the Earth to within extraordinary degrees of accuracy, um, and uh, Archimedes and all these people. But the point that uh, um, uh, Smith would make about all that is that it didn't end up with any economic development whatsoever. And in fact, all that science simply impoverished the peasants of Egypt who were being burdened with the taxation to pay for that science, but none of it translated into technological or economic growth. And so the, the ancient world actually shows a very good example of how the funding of pure science in the absence of a market, because there was no real market in those days, is simply a waste of people's money. But isn't a lot of especially pure science a really long game in the sense that we put all of this effort in, we make these discoveries, but it may take – 100, 200, 300, 400 years before those discoveries snowball with others we've made along the way and then radically improve the lives of people. And so I, I could see an argument that it's like, sure, the, the peasants at the time did not benefit, but on the whole, the world is far better off today or at some point since this research was done because the research was done. And if we had been focusing only on what would have, you know, what we know would better our peasants today, then we never would have seen the enormous progress. Well, it is, of course, true that you get developments in science that sometimes are not really translated into economic or technological benefit for one or two hundred years. That statement is quite correct. The question is, actually, do you need government funding to achieve those? Or if you lived in a world where there was no government funding, would, in fact, as we now call them, philanthropists and institutions fund those separately and independently? And the Adam Smith argument was that they would have. He himself, for example, got a studentship to do his work at, at Balliol College, Oxford, because a philanthropist had endowed a studentship that he was able to, to capture. And in his day, there was a significant, rather like American universities today, there was a significant philanthropic uh, world around Oxford and Cambridge and the universities of Glasgow and Edinburgh. And coupled with the fact that these institutions could charge really quite significant fees to their students, he, he argued – I mean I'm not saying he would have argued. He did argue that there was no need even for those long-term uh, developments that you described to be funded by the government because in fact there were a sufficient number of private individuals around who would have funded them. And we see the revolution too that Adam Smith is the Industrial Revolution, the beginning of it and an agricultural revolution before that. All these seem to create – technology that was more useful, very slowly uh, more useful for people in creating innovations, especially in the Industrial Revolution. Yes. I mean one of the really interesting stories is why did the Industrial Revolution take place in Britain then? I actually think it's the other way around. I think the question is why didn't the Industrial Revolution take place much, much earlier? If you look back through history, you see constantly really exciting periods of time when, for example, Italy – Renaissance Italy was a ferment of fantastic commercial development. You know, they invented double entry bookkeeping. They invented all sorts. They invented the, the, the check. They invented all sorts of technologies for commerce. And just as Italy was about to take off, it unfortunately got invaded by the French and the Spanish and the Austrians. And so the history of the world really uh, – China is another very good example. China had some fantastic technology. They invented printing or they invented um, – Gunpowder and – yeah. Long, long, long before we did in the West. But unfortunately, time and time again, they get these emperors who just crush everything. So I think the question is the other way around. Um, the Industrial Revolution happened in Britain because we'd had the glorious revolution of 1688. And frankly, there was no one around to stop it from developing. <laughs> we did have coal. We did have steel. That was all terribly helpful. But I think England, after 1688, would have developed something glorious anyway. And what Adam Smith would have said is the market generates both the need – and the incentive. If, you, if, if we three sitting around this table were competing in a market, we would each of us have a strong incentive to do research and development to beat the other two. And because research and development is always unpredictable, who knows what discoveries you ultimately end up making. You don't need government to incentivize the three of us to try to defeat each other in the market. What about something like a good – right around the time we're talking about now, a good counterexample possibly is the longitude prize. Uh, 
th- th- this seems like something in the story we tell that this was a, solving a very difficult problem that was very important and using public money but with co- competition behind it. Could government do something like that or did it do it successfully with the Longitude Prize? No, that is a very good question and I think you've slightly got me on slightly the back foot. But let me just make a few <laughs> points about this before I concede defeat. <laughs> First of all, the government actually only put the money afterwards. So Harrison had to develop his clock mm-hmm. in the anticipation. Um, and um, the government also cheated and didn't actually pay up for about 20 years. They, they didn't give Harrison uh, his I due. I remember that, yeah. yeah. But I think, although you, what you say is quite true, that's not, that's not really government funding research. It's more government acting on behalf of society to identify a need. It's more corporate state um, because okay, so let's have a counterfactual. If the government hadn't done that, would there still have been a need for better determination of longitude? And would someone like Harrison eventually have developed a better clock? The answer is obviously yes. So I think what the government was doing was actually anticipating the market signals. Um, though it is a good question, and one cannot pretend that all government money is always wasted. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Even a broken clock is right sometimes. So. <laughs> yeah, twice a day, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so the question I guess we can get to is is to frame the rest of the conversation. Is science a public good then? Oh, no, no, no. There, well, no what is the argument that it is and, yeah. that, and what's wrong with that? Yeah, that is a very interesting argument and it's one I've dedicated too many years of my life to. But I'm now very clear that it's absolutely not a public good. The public good story is very, very simple. Um, imagine the three of us are competing in the marketplace and I go out there and do lots of research and development, which is very, very expensive, and I develop a better product. You two can copy my product more cheaply than it costs me to make it. So you can get the information. You can either go to the library and read the papers or you can go to the patent library and read the patents. Or you can just take my machinery and put it to bits and work out how to copy. And the cost of copying is so much less than the cost of innovation that when you do copy, you end up with much more capital in your company than I have because I've already spent all my capital. And so you'll drive me into bankruptcy. That's the public good argument. The trouble with that argument and the reason it's actually wrong, and you can state categorically it's wrong, there's lots of evidence that it's wrong, is that actually it's very expensive to copy. The studies have been done. Um, the costs, the direct, direct, the direct costs of copying technology ready to take to the marketplace are about 65% of the cost of innovation, you know, averaged out across a number of industries and large number of companies. But that's only the direct costs. The indirect costs bring it up to 100% because... To copy, you need to have skilled scientists, skilled researchers, skilled technologists who actually understand what it is they're trying to copy. You, if I were to take you and put you in the middle of Unilever and say, copy that product, you wouldn't be able to do it. You need to be a chemist to be able to do that. And to be a chemist able to copy, you've actually got to be of sufficient quality that you're actually generating your own science. And if you're not generating science of the equivalent quality in the same sort of field, you simply are not qualified to copy. That's just the pragmatic reality of it. And we know that sometimes companies like DuPont, for example, very interesting example, try to stop their scientists from publishing for sort of decades of the time, and the scientists cease to become productive, and the company's fortunes collapse because they weren't able to import the science and technology from other people because no one in the company was prepared to do it. So if you want a copy, you've got to be an active scientist yourself. So you've got to contribute to the pool of knowledge. That's the payment to the pool of knowledge. And, uh, and it's absolutely not a public good. It's a good that's really only available to other people who contribute. So just earlier this year, Martin Ricketts and I, he's a professor at Buckingham, published a paper entitled In Research Policy, which is the top journal in this field, entitled Modeling Science as a Contribution Good. And we, we model that against science as a public good. And the empirical data fits the fact that science isn't a public good. There's no evidence that, that government funding of science has actually ever stimulated economic growth. And so you, you, we have to discard the public good model. But the public good model is simply based on a misconception. You can't just copy other people's science. Only active scientists who contribute can copy other people's science. Let me ask a question about those costs of copying versus costs of innovation because it seems like one big difference – so you both in, in both cases, you need skilled people putting a lot of time in and participating. But the, a big difference between an innovation and copying is with copying, you know there's something at the end of the process. Whereas with innovation, there's going to be a lot of blind alleys and dead ends. And so, yeah, you may get something, but you may have gone – had all sorts of starts that went nowhere. But the copier says, "I there it is. I can see it. I just have to figure out how to do it. So do those costs of kind of I guess, failed innovation or innovation that didn't happen because it 
petered out, factored into the cost of copying? On the direct cost of copying, no. On the indirect, I think they are because there's another consequence of the fact that research is, un- is unpredictable. Sometimes you produce very good things that you never thought you were going to produce in the first place. Um, I mean, the classic example is Nokia. You know, it set it out, started off as a forestry company, ended up making mobile phones or cell phones, as you call them here, because that was the way their te- technology ended up. So everyone is engaged in R&D for a number of different purposes, one of which is to try to create innovations of their own, another of which is to copy. And each of them that has a spectrum of activities, so all the competitors are all engaging in their own full starts because they're not engaging in their own primary research. Ultimately, they're not going to be able to copy anyway. So the costs of the full starts are actually shared between everyone in the industry. It's just the cost of doing business. So you're absolutely right. Some of those calculations, the direct costs are not taken into account, but the indirect costs – so the direct costs of copying are 65%, but the full starts come within the indirect costs, within the 35% that I, I talked about, the tacit knowledge and all the other material you have to invest into before you start the business of copying. Does this apply though to things I – mean, maybe the, I feel like everyone would be thinking about things like the super colliders and these sort of things that could only come through public funding or maybe – Maybe the answer is if they come from public funding, maybe they shouldn't even be built. Maybe they're just too expensive and not worth it. And then people would say, well, what is your, about your fascination with the universe? Don't you just want to know about smashing atoms together? Well, let, let's take that point because what's often forgotten is how huge science was funded in this country. You know, in, in the United States of America, there was no public funding of science of any significant value whatsoever before 1940. And yet you had the 100-inch and the 200-inch Palomar telescopes. You had Mooney Goddard getting his rockets up to 7,000 feet and developing all the technology that NASA and I regret to say the Nazis ultimately used, all this funded by the Carnegie Foundation in that case and the Rockefeller Foundation. And what's interesting is that before 1940, there's an enormous outpouring of philanthropic support for science in, in this country. So, for example, when the Manhattan Project started, um, and the, the scientists out on the West Coast needed a cyclotron. They actually got the cyclotron funded by one of the East Coast philanthropic foundations because the government at the time didn't understand the need for a cyclotron because the government at the time didn't understand the need for an atom bomb. So the early part of atom bomb technology, although it was a government program, was actually being funded by philanthropists who understood better than the government what was needed. So the answer to the point is um, ultimately that if there really is – a human desire for knowledge that you described. You either leave it to people like Bill Gates who make their fortunes of investing in foundations or you say to people, well, you've got the American Heart Foundation, you've got the American Diabetes Association. You know, what's to stop individuals coming together? Let me give you an example of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. SETI has a budget of $7 million a year. There's not a trivial amount of money given to them by multimillionaires who really believe that we should be looking for little green men out there. So I just don't see any evidence of, of philanthropic failure. So you say that we could just come together, form organizations that would then fund it, the American Heart Association and SETI and whatnot. But isn't that, as our friends on the left would say, precisely what government is? Government is us coming together and deciding we want to, in this case, fund science. Yeah, but the difference is that the government can send policemen to my house at 3 o'clock in the morning and arrest me if I haven't made my contributions to science. And lots of people don't want to contribute to science. There are lots of Christians, for example, fundamentalist Christians, who think science is very threatening to their faith, you know, who don't believe in evolution, who don't. So I think that um, the trouble with the government is that it, it, is the, it has coercion. I mean, I'm in the middle of the Cato here. <laughs> you, you know this. And the question is, should people be coerced into supporting this sort of thing, and I think the answer is no. What about the – you make the argument that government is, however imperfectly, answerable to the people. It's we, – we elect people. We vote on issues. So government therefore represents the will of the people and the funding it might in, in some aggregate represents the will of the people. But if we kick it over entirely to rich people or foundations, then science – what gets funded and the kind of scientific progress we might make – is now subject just to the whims of plutocrats. Now, that is a very good argument and I, I half agree with it. Uh, I do – only half, but I do half agree with it. I think there is a role for a democratically funded science and I, I think it's simply summed up in one word, cigarettes. I mean, would we have discovered what we know about cigarettes and the damage they do without government funding of science? Well, actually, we probably would have, funnily enough, because Richard Dole, he did work for the Medical Research Council in England, so he was funded under the government program. But I actually think 
that if you go back at the time, there was sufficient concern about the growth of lung cancer. Lung cancer just came from nowhere. And that's why people like Richard Dahl were looking at it. It was absolutely in the air. Where has lung cancer suddenly come from? It was this explosion of cigarette smoking that took place in the 20s and 30s after the First World War. So I actually think that there is sufficient evidence that the foundations would, in fact, have addressed that problem. However, however, I do accept your point as a fundamental point that a democratic government should fill in the gaps if they see areas that the either the philanthropists or industry aren't funding – I think that is the role of democratic government. But it's relatively inexpensive that that's not fundamental sort of science to create economic growth. And secondly, don't fool yourself into thinking you're going to create economic growth that way because you won't. But you may well need a social, meet a social need that neither philanthropists nor industry will meet. And there I'm with you. Can we trust even the apparatus of democratic government to be funding I – mean, sometimes it might be funding smoking – anti-smoking campaign or smoking research into smoke into the causes. But at other times, it might be funding something based on politics that ends up being bad science or in yeah. bad – because the whims of the, demo, the, the democratic body politic are definitely not uh, very get, scientific. No, you get gross abuse. I mean this pork barreling, you know, roads in Alaska, the bridges that end in the middle of nowhere. And they're huge numbers. There was a fascinating debate in America between 1945 and 1950, which, which really has now been forgotten, but is, it illustrates this point beautifully. By 1945, there was universal bipartisan agreement that America needed the government to fund more science because before 1940, the American government funded no science. And there was bipartisan agreement that with the Cold War and the new world we're moving into, we should fund science. I, I don't believe in that, but, but forgetting that, that's what the American people and their representatives believed. But there was a fascinating and totally um, um, sterilizing uh, argument which for five years stopped anything from happening because there were two schools of thought. There was the school of thought that came behind Vannevar Bush, who was the famous intellectual who wrote Science the Endless Frontier. And he said that scientific money should be distributed only by scientists to other scientists based on merit. On the other hand, against him, Senator Kilgore, with the complete support of President Truman, said that's undemocratic. Money should be distributed only by uh, politicians and it should be according to national need. So every state would get as much money for its research in proportion to its population, nothing to do with merit. And so Massachusetts, which has this extraordinary collection of brilliant science in Boston, would get no more money than Colorado, which is uh, – or Arkansas, which is a different – and um, – and Congress looked at this and decided that the president was wrong and that Kilgore was wrong and in 1947 passed a bill to create the National Science Foundation where money was distributed by scientists to other scientists on the basis of merit and merit alone and it was vetoed by Truman and his veto – it's all in there actually – and the veto states this – represents a lack of faith in the democratic process. But hey, we all know about public choice. We all know about pork barreling. We see what our representatives actually do. They're the last people to distribute research grants. And so in 1950, when the crisis developed because of the Korean War and other crises coming out of the Soviet Union, uh, the executive surrendered to the legislature and we ended up with the system we have now. And to be fair to the system we have now, if you can keep democratically elected politicians out of it and just leave it to elite scientists funding other elite scientists, I don't think it does as well as the market does, but it certainly isn't a disaster. And the quality of American science these days is, of course, of international excellence. Is it, is it possible that in certain situations, maybe – I'm thinking, for example, dietary research uh, in the, U, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and suggesting different things for dietary purposes, uh, but being influenced by, say, the meat lobby – in terms of what they're going to recommend. Are they going to recommend no trans fat? Are they going to recommend less red meat? But then the meat lobby comes in and, and puts some pressure on this in terms of science and where the funding is going is, and then starts to skew the dietary science. And it, I mean if you think about the history of what the American government has recommended it for diet at different points, it seems to be wildly all over the place and based a lot on – on research that maybe was wrong as we now think butter is OK, for example. Well, actually, that is a very perceptive point because one of the problems of democratically funded science is that it makes you vulnerable to lobbyists. I think dietary research is in a terrible state. Um, I mean, for example, you know, we're all told that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It's not unrelated to the fact that almost every study that says that is ended up ultimately funded by General Mills or Kellogg's or Post. I mean, um, and that doesn't mean that this is corrupt, but it just means that there's clearly an incentive to find those sort of findings. 
And so one of the great dangers of democratically funded science is that you end up with a government actually acting on behalf of the lobbyists because they're told that's good for um, employment in Minnesota. And so it, it is a double danger, whereas the Rockefeller Foundation could do the same dietary research and wouldn't give a damn about employment in Minnesota. It would just try to find what the truth was. So democratic science can be very dangerous. But I'm struck that your <clears throat> example of how democratic science could go wrong was made by pointing to studies funded by private companies and showing how those – how the private funding influences the studies in perhaps the wrong direction. So isn't this precisely the kind of problem that would also exist with public – with private funding of science that you would have General Mills and Kellogg saying we're going to fund stuff but only if it looks like it's going to tell people to eat more Wheaties? I would actually go the other way. I would actually say that the great foundations like the Gates Foundation or whatever – would be much more likely to look fairly at uh, dietary research if they didn't feel the government was already doing it for them. And the trouble is the government isn't doing it. The government appears to be doing it in an objective and dispassionate way, but actually is far too susceptible to this terrible private funding. So this, this comes out of the question you asked 10 minutes ago. Is there a role for government funding of science to act as a third lobby against philanthropists and against industry? To which the answer is yes, but unfortunately it doesn't do it very well. It's far too susceptible to this pressure from lobbyists. So very often, government ends up amplifying the message that the lobbyists want and it's a very dangerous thing. What about incidental effects? I think a lot of people are probably thinking, OK, sure, dietary stuff, lobbyists researching specific things. But isn't the case that, for example, the American military has just – just by researching its own aims has given huge amounts of innovation to the world and especially the space program, you know, whether it's Tang or <laughs> space ice cream or all these – and computers and all these things that have come out of this. They were pursuing one thing but then all these amazing things came out on the other side. Well, people have done studies on this and I can give you references. I mean military research is only about 10 percent as valuable as civil research. I, it's a complete waste of money. The whole NASA program has been a complete waste of money. I mean, what benefit did we actually get from landing men on the moon? Um, it's, it's, it was all a defense initiative and a national projection of pride. The Americans were deeply offended in 1957 that the Soviets launched Sputnik first. But what good did that do the Soviet Union, which, which collapsed with the economic complete failure 30 years later? The whole model of these grand projects creating these spillovers that benefit society, actually it doesn't work. The benefits of NASA have been trivial. I mean, you know, it's, and it's not true about um, uh, stick, you know, the, 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 the non-stick frying pan. That had nothing to do with oh, NASA. Oh, Teflon. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing that is relevant here is you know, the internet. And it's absolutely true that CERN, you know, which, is your, which is the super collider that we have in Europe, uh, did produce an individual who did make this extraordinary development in, in what was then called distributed computing. To which I would say, if you look at the gargantuan, gargantuan sums of money invested in these research programs, of course something's going to come out of it. The question is, would something come out of it if there had been none of these gargantuan programs? The money, therefore, had retained within the corporations, within society at large? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, the classic example is the aeroplane. There was a race in the very, very early part of the 20th century between the Wright brothers and Langley of the Smithsonian. Now, the Wright brothers won that race. Um, but if Langley had won that race, everyone would have said, well, we wouldn't have the airplane but for government funding of science. He was funded by the government. Um, so – and yet, of course, we know – so no one ever makes that argument. And the airplane, of course, we now understand. And because the airplane is provided by private funding, Edison was privately funded, Tesla was privately funded, somehow people forget all that. They only look at what has been funded by the state, assuming somehow that that wouldn't have been funded. But I would say to you that just as the private sector produced the airplane, so the private sector would have produced distributed computing, the internet – if it only it hadn't been crowded out by government funding. You say that NASA was incredibly expensive and produced little of value. And I'm reminded of a lot of arguments that came up a little while back when I think NASA shut down the space shuttle program, was it? Um, because and the argument was, you know, we this is very expensive, we can't do it and it's not, you know, and people would say we shouldn't be spending money on this because it's not producing things of concrete value. But the response was often there is a huge value, call it even like a spiritual value in these massive flights of exploration, in reaching for the stars, in trying to go beyond our planet, in exploring and learning and that those are deeply central to what it means to be human. And so we would be 
kind of – Less at, of a people. We'd be less yeah. of a people. We would be atrophying ourselves to – if we stepped back from that and said, look, we're only going to spend money on these kinds of things that we know we're going to produce – the internet and whatever else, and if we we stop looking beyond the horizons, yeah. that, that there's something there's something like anti-human yeah. about that. Yeah. Well, let's do the counterfactual. Um, what would ha- what would have happened if the Second World War hadn't broken out? Mooney Goddard, up in Massachusetts, had developed all the fundamental technology that NASA and the Nazis then took over. And his rockets were going up to 7,000 feet by 1940. He developed the liquid fuels. He developed the gyroscopes. He developed the whole thing. And the only reason he didn't put the first artificial satellite into space sometime in the early 1940s, i.e. 15 years before the Soviets did it, was the Second World War broke out and he was pulled out of that and told to develop a bazooka because we needed a bazooka to kill lots and lots of Germans. Um, so, but, but for that... The, 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 the philanthropic sector would have got the first uh, – and then, of course, once you've got one in space, then people like Richard Branson come in and develop all the sort of stuff that they wanted to do. So what I think I'm saying here is if you look at things like the Palomar 200-inch telescopes and the fantastic investment in space that was felt by the philanthropists that you have described so beautifully, I think those things would actually have been met by a sector – I mean, it's very hard to show anything in astronomy that wasn't actually funded independently by the, by the, by the private sector because what you've described really relate you – know, people respond to that and people like Bill Gates would be funding it if, if it wasn't being done for him by NASA. I'm pretty sure about that. Now, in terms of whether or not this actually can – public funding of science, this public good of science contributing to economic growth, contributing to better standards of living, there's some pretty good – data on this that, that is pretty much shows that it doesn't, correct? The OECD studies and yeah. have shown it, – it's, it's quite good. Talk a little bit about how that data what – it, what it shows and how it's, clear it shows it. It's really important because it shows it beautifully. The OECD did a study called uh, Sources of Growth in OECD Countries 2003. That's what it's called and it was published in 2003 and it's on the web. And they looked at the 21 leading countries of the world, the 21 members of the OECD, and they looked over a 26-year period. And they simply did a very careful multivariate analysis. Um, and of course, they had such a long period of time, it was longitudinal, so they were able to say, look, com- country A in 1978 does that. What does its GDP look like five years later, 10 years later, 20 years later? So they were able to get to the nearest you can with cause and effect. And what they found, and they looked at a whole host of parameters, the OECD has a vast amount of data available to it, but amongst many of the parameters they looked at was the public and private funding of research and development. R&D is bigger than just science. It also incorporates industrial research as well as academic science. And the finding was dramatic. And because it wasn't expected by the OECD, and it's indeed it wasn't welcomed by the OECD, it has much more value because this wasn't – we're not talking about confirmation bias here. This was lack of confirmation bias, which upset everyone. And what they found very dramatically – and they weren't the first to do that um, – there's an individual in this city called Park at American University looking at the same data, came up with the same findings, and indeed I had myself at the same time as, as well. But what the OECD did more comprehensively than anyone else, they showed – that the, there was a direct correlation between the degree of private funding of R&D and subsequent economic growth. There was zero correlation between public funding of R&D and subsequent economic growth. In fact, they suggested there was a slightly negative correlation. It looked as if the public funding of research and development actually slightly damaged economic growth, presumably by crowding out private funding or by pulling privately funded researchers out of the private sector into the public sector, where they may have done very nice science, but it didn't benefit anyone economically. And that is a really damaging attack on the concept of science as a public good. There are other damaging attacks, but that's a particularly powerful one. And so, so we have this National Science Foundation. We have this pretty good idea of – and you mentioned how they were created in the, in the in scientists giving science grants. And we've talked about lobbyists in different industries in, you know, creating and in, in influencing how the science is being done. What is the National Science Foundation? The question I think is what is the harm, right? Other than other than the resources taken out of society, but someone would say, "Oh, you libertarians are always talking about that. You're always talking about no oh, taxation takes resources out of society." But what's the harm of you know giving a National Science Foundation? Which I'm, I I don't know what the budget is. You probably have a better. I'm sure it's very small. It's a rounding error in the U.S. budget compared to Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and military spending. So what's the harm? Well, that's a fair question. I think the harm. Now, I think the number of levels are harm. You're absolutely right. The NSF and the NIH obviously do good work. 
and to some extent they're simply doing work that would otherwise have been done anyway in the private sector. And the quality of science funded is very high and it's competitive and it's tough, uh, tough for the researchers and therefore they have to produce high quality science. I think the harm is a symbolic harm really. It gives the impression to society at large that without government we wouldn't have science and also perhaps more importantly because everyone understands the link between science and economic growth it also suggests that without government we wouldn't have economic growth and so it's damaging at a spiritual level really because it means that we are handing over to the government the the, the belief that good things good cultural things and good economic things can be delivered only by government it therefore empowers government and in this country more than any in the world founded by people deeply skeptical of, of central government, it actually hits at the very root of what made the United States of America the United States of America. The United States of America is all about the individual or the state, but certainly not about the federal government. But what we've done is we have legitimized federal government in a really important area of life. I mean, you were talking earlier about the spiritual benefits of going to the moon and stuff. If those are all captured by the government, then actually in a, sunny sort of, in a funny sort of way, the individual is, is minimized and government is legitimized. Let me, for example, give you an example of the cloning of the human genome, the sequencing of the human genome. That was a largely private sector activity. In Britain, it was largely funded by the Wellcome Trust, which was a huge charity. In this country, it was funded as much um, by Celera, which was this company created by Craig Venter, as it was actually by NSF and NIH. But who declared the triumph in, 19, in 2000? It was Tony Blair and Bill Clinton standing together on the podium, which is connected... Uh, simultaneously on different podiums, but it came out to the world as one uh, image, celebrating uh, this as if it was a government-funded program, ultimately legitimizing Bill Clinton and Tony Blair. Well, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to legitimize Bill Clinton <laughs> and Tony Blair more than they deserve, and they didn't deserve that. <laughs> I'm curious about different avenues of research and how they might play with public versus private funding. So are there areas, if if we have a lot of public funding right now, that – we're not getting as much research in as we might if things were more privately funded, um, that there might be benefits for us from us pursuing those paths. And then then the flip side, are there if, if we got rid of public or if we got rid of most of public funding, are there areas of science that we would expect to see dry up as a result? Well, I think with public funding you do get significant misappropriation of funds. Um, I mean, if you think the, the, the purpose of science is to benefit society, there's no question that the marketplace ultimately tells us what society needs better than do inward-looking groups of scientists. What inward-looking groups of scientists do is they take public money and they work out the most interesting science that's available to them and then they go into that. And, of course, you know, as we've agreed, it's high quality and it's not without its value. But it's not what the private sector would have been funding. I mean, for example, NIH has received I don't know how many trillions of dollars <laughs> over the last uh, 50 years. And yet we actually are in a situation where the drug companies are producing fewer and fewer new drugs. So something has gone wrong with that funding into NIH because where are the new drugs? They're certainly not coming out of NIH. And so I think that what has happened is that science is being driven – by the priorities of scientists who have been allowed to work unchecked, really, by the needs of society. And I would like to see – or I, I believe that if the NIH didn't exist, we would certainly have more R&D taking place within more drug companies. And I think that benefits to human health would actually be better because drug companies do invest a great deal in pure science. It's simply not true that they would neglect pure science. So I think the answer to your question is – by having government-funded science, and again, I almost go back to Truman, we get into a situation where you have, to use a cliche, an ivory tower of scientists funding other scientists for science that they think is the most interesting, looking at the opportunities available to them. But it does get divorced from the needs of society. We need more drugs, and there are very few of them coming out. Where are the antibiotics? There hasn't been a new antibiotic for 20 years. Um, that is not reflecting society's best interests. And our, it seems that we see, could imagine the results or the – the inputs and the and the pressures being skewed towards certain things, and we think about medical science, for example, um, AIDS research heavily funded, uh, in because AIDS became very politically a very political thing, out of proportion to other diseases that maybe don't have the same level of of political will behind it. So we maybe we could say that AIDS research was overfunded compared to 
cancer, for example, possibly, that the politics push it in that direction and create a skewed system. I but, think, it, and, and with, maybe with global warming and stuff too. Yeah, what well, well, we see it today in just uh, Ebola. I mean, you know, we all know about the deaths in Ebola in Africa, but at the same time, the, every day for every every patient who dies from Ebola, sadly, two patients are dying from malaria, mm-hmm. and we've known that for a very, very long time. And so, you're absolutely right. AIDS was deeply politicized. A huge amount of money went into AIDS. And actually, to be fair, fantastic benefits came out of it. I mean, AIDS is a completely different disease than it was 30 years ago, 40 years ago. It's astonishing. Well, 30 years ago. Astonishing. But um, AIDS could also have been handled uh, at a different level. I mean, epidemiologically, people could have been more careful about practices, their private practices, and also about blood transfusions and things. So there were a number of different ways that disease could have been addressed. Yes, I think AIDS did receive disproportionate amount of public funding. On the other hand, to be fair to AIDS, it has worked remarkably well. Um, And whether industry alone would have done it as effectively, I think the answer I'd have to say, to be honest, would be no. But whether the number of AIDS uh, sufferers in this country would have reflected the proportion of the Investment Probably not because, of course, AIDS became very sexy in terms of science. You know, the scientists who first discovered the virus got the Nobel Prize and all that sort of thing because it captured a sort of public mood. Um, it's a difficult question. It's a but, difficult question. But the analogy you made to Ebola is, I think, a good one because on a market-driven research, if you were if you were creating a product to make people's lives better, well, there's far more uh, – there's a bigger consumer base of malaria sufferers than Ebola sufferers who you couldn't you couldn't create a business around Ebola manuf- drugs by themselves, which is maybe a demonstration that it's, well, not, it's not where you should be putting your you efforts. You could sell a lot them. of Ebola vaccines to panicked Americans. Yes, that, that is true. So maybe you could, but but maybe that just demonstrates that that's not where you should be putting your efforts. Not Ebola. You should be looking at influenza and malaria things that don't get wall-to-wall media coverage. Oh, I'm sure that's true, these, these neglected diseases. I mean, to be fair to the scientific community, there is a lot of malaria research. The trouble is there are no, there are no opportunities. No one can understand. The scientists can't understand how you handle this um, because, you know, as you know, the malaria uh, organism is very clever at changing its antigens all the time. And so th- th- if there were better opportunities there, I'm sure the scientific community would have moved in there more. Um, but there is a vast potential market for malaria it could it could definitely be left to the private sector when the opportunities arose. As for Ebola, I mean, the tragedy about Ebola, yes, of course, vaccines and stuff are very important. But actually, you could control Ebola just by better public health measures. In fact, it's a reflection of the poverty of those societies, unfortunately. And in, in, in the other instance, too, I know that our colleague Pat Michaels, a friend, friend of all of ours, uh, I mean, he, he definitely thinks that government funding of climate change research – uh, in in a one specific way and not toward another side is is skewing the results in a way that's undesirable for truth and it seems like that's the kind of thing we could we would expect it to be pushing in one direction. Oh, he's absolutely right. I um, mean, Climate Gate. You know, when they discovered all those emails, it's very clear. Here was a group of scientists absolutely determined to defend their funding, and governments have. It's strange, really, how governments have bought into the global warming so comprehensively. I think they've done so because it really legitimizes the role of government. I mean, really, only government could address these issues, uh, carbon taxing and all the rest of it. And so governments had a very strong interest in global warming being a really serious issue because it puts politicians center stage. Um, And there is no doubt that the whole global warming community is very much biased towards one direction. So if if you challenge it, you know, you're called a denier with all the overturns that that has. Um, and you're not going to get government funding. And you certainly won't get government funding and you have difficulty publishing your papers. I, I mean, I, I have always believed long, long ago, this is why Pat and I get on so well, that the best analogy we have with global warming is the scare over eugenics. Eugenics is a really terrible story. And between 1900 and 1945, I mean, in this country, in the United States of America, Something like, I mean, in the state of California alone, 100,000 mentally defective people were compulsory sterilized against their will in, in that 45-year period. And lots of other appalling things took place in the name of eugenics in America, in Scandinavia. Forget what happened under the Nazis, but under huge tracts of Europe um, and North America, eugenics legitimized some really dreadful practices. You had people like H.G. Wells or George Bernard Shaw actively advocating the gassing and elimination of genetically inferior people. 
Can you imagine? Can you imagine? D.H. Lawrence actually said, thank God for poison gas. I mean, the, the culture, the atmosphere out of which Hitler did was was actually being laid out by Western scientists and Western thinkers. I repeat, D.H. Lawrence, H.G. Wells, Bernard Shaw, really top public intellectuals advocating the elimination of people who carried the wrong genes. And out of that, you get a very unfortunate culture that Hitler was not a unique person. He was responding to his culture. And, and that's very dangerous. And I think global warming is in the same area of a group of scientists who can see real benefit to their own research with politicians who can see a real benefit to themselves, feeding on each other to create this mass panic. After all, it's not at all clear, and I'm sure there is global warming. I'm not sure, at all sure it's a bad thing, uh, and I'm not, I'm not at all sure it's anthropogenic either. Um, but if, in as much as it is, it's probably doing more good than harm. You say that government funding government will prefer that people – that people's research supports things that then government wants to do. So if gov- you know if your research says government should get involved and stop this problem, then that's the kind of thing that's get more funding. I'm curious how that plays in with one of the biases we hear about in scientific research more broadly, which is the bias towards positive results. That we know that if you do a study and find a positive correlation. That's much Co- more – Yeah, cancer from coffee or something like that. Right. You get, like, so you, cancer – you find that coffee causes cancer. That's much more likely to get published than you find that coffee does not cause which cancer. Which is just as important as the positive results. Uh, and, and this happens – I mean this happens across science. But would public or private funding make that problem better or worse? Well, it's a problem that comes out of competitive grant awards because grant – giving bodies are simply – I mean I think this is much an internal scientific problem as one caused by government funding. The question is if you apply for funds in the competitive way, who's going to get those funds? And the scientist who makes a positive discovery somehow captures the imagination of his fellow scientists or her fellow scientists or the grant giving bodies. So I think that is frankly a consequence of competitive funding of science. And it might just be the cost of doing science. I'm not quite sure – how you address it, except that you as a community, as a scientific community, can recognize that this is a tremendous skewing and that negative results should be published just as fully. Now, to be fair, there's a huge move to register um, surveys like this in advance and make sure they're always being published. It comes out of the corruptions of the, I regret to say, of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, The pharmaceutical industry has done some bad things. I mean, who hasn't? We all do bad things. And the pharmaceutical industry has certainly done bad things. So, for example, one of the tricks the pharmaceutical industry got up to, let's say you've got a drug A, which is probably not very good for a disease B. It actually probably slightly damages it. But if you commission 10 different surveys, then about seven of those surveys will show it's, it's done you harm. A couple of surveys will show nothing. But one might show benefit because that's just the nature of statistical error. That's the one you publish. And so in response to that, there's a huge move now that all these processes, all these surveys should be registered in advance and there's an obligation on you to publish the findings, whatever they are. And perhaps that should go across the board so the side of the community can address its own problems and say everything should be published, including negative findings. But of course, it's accentuated and aggravated not so much by government funding of, of, of competitive grants, but by the sheer process of having competitive grants. So I guess as a, as a final question, we can just look at this and, and say, what does the world look like without public funding of science and why is it a, a better place? Um, there are two answers to that. The first one is the world without the government funding of science empowers the individual more. It means that individuals as individuals but also individual corporations, individual universities do not feel in any sense that they are inferior to the state. We don't have a situation where the state is legitimized because only it can fund science. And for me, that's a major cultural thing. I do not want to legitimize the state because it's an organization that uses coercion beyond that which it absolutely needs to do. That's why I'm a libertarian. So anything that legitimizes the state, if it's not necessary, I'm opposed to. And since the state does not have to fund science, I would prefer a world in which the state funded no science and that was an area of legitimization that was lost to the state. What would science look like? Well, the universities wouldn't do so much research. There's no question about that. The universities now do much more research than they otherwise would have done. They would therefore focus much more on teaching. They would still do research and they would still have PhD students to train people up to become the scientists of the future. But they wouldn't be turning themselves. Places like Harvard, Yale and Princeton are practically research institutions with a few undergraduates attached. 
Um, and you could argue that that's real distortion of what the mission of those institutions should be. So there'd be much less research taking place in universities, but there would still be sufficient, because we know that from pre-1940, to train all the scientists that society needs. There'd be much more science taking place in industry, in companies, but there would also be more philanthropic science. There'd be more Gates Foundations around. And I would argue that um, that would be a healthier mix of research because one of the things you've really got to avoid and what we have and unfortunately to some extent in this country but also in Europe is NIH and NSF have too much power, too much monopolistic power imposing too much one particular vision on the world and you get a much healthier scientific community if there are lots of competing funding bodies with their own different cultures you're more likely to get a richer mix of science with a complex mixture of funding bodies. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.